Monday. Yeah. Um, today we'll get started talking about part one. So on Wednesday we'll continue talking about part one. We won't uh, get past that. So I ask you to have finished reading part one. Um, you, you don't have to read past that. If you want to get a little bit ahead, that's fine. Um, but on Wednesday we'll still be talking about part one. And finally I will return papers. I'm sorry that took me a while. We were talking about the preface and why Kant thinks, on the one hand, a full ethical theory would include both pure a priori elements, but also empirical elements. And then also why he thinks it's important here in the groundwork to limit the investigation to the pure part, um, to, to simply a priori considerations. The way we're going to proceed, I mentioned at the end last time, was to try to analyze our ordinary, common sense, pre-philosophical, moral judgments, and try to analyze them in a way that will allow us to discover what he's really looking for here, the supreme principle of morality, the fundamental moral principle. And I'll just remind you that I said last time that Kant is very optimistic, probably over-optimistic, that everybody shares a moral sense, that everybody has a conscience that uh, agrees with everyone else. Um, and so analyzing our ordinary common sense moral sensibility, our ordinary common sense moral judgment, will allow us to hone in on supreme principle of morality. But on the other hand, I also said he's pessimistic, maybe too pessimistic, about whether uh, this moral conscience is very effective in most people, or in a lot of people, in moving us to do, to do the right thing, the thing that we all know in our hearts is the correct thing to do. Okay, so in this section, again, we're analyzing what he takes for granted to be the correct moral judgments that everybody shares in order to try to find the supreme principle of morality. So notice, uh, he's assuming, first of all, that there is such a thing as morality, that we all recognize that and we all understand that. Then in part two, we'll continue this investigation by analyzing, giving an analysis of the idea of an autonomous will. Uh, we will see that this is the key to understanding morality, the idea of understanding an autonomous, rational will. And by analyzing this idea of an autonomous will, we will once again find a path to that same supreme principle of morality. And then in part three, we get something that's kind of different because both parts one and two sort of started from assumptions, either that there is such a thing as morality, or that we have an autonomy, each of us has an autonomous will. And in part three, we sort of examine what kind of defense or what kind of argument we can provide for that assumption that we do, in fact, have an autonomous will, so that our actions are bound by Morality. And this is, um, as you know from uh, the discussion a couple of hours ago about the first critique, this is not going to be something that we can get either empirical evidence for or a scientific, a natural scientific proof for. So what we'll do is see what kind of defense confidence we can do. Okay, questions about that? We're ready to start chapter uh, part one. Alright. So it's sometimes said that Kant doesn't have a theory of value. He doesn't have a theory of what's good or bad. He's only concerned with like rule following or duty or something like that. And this is often said in Kant to contrast Kant with utilitarianism 
or with consequentialism, who, which, after all, is concerned with producing what? Good, producing the maximum value or as much goodness as possible. Um, and it's often said, in contrast, that Kant is unconcerned with whether our actions are good, whether they have good consequences, and instead he's only concerned with following the rules or something like doing our duty. But look how he starts part one. He says, it is impossible to think of anything at all in the world or even beyond it, or indeed even beyond it, that could be taken to be good without limitation except a good will. Okay, so starting by telling us what uh, he believes to be good, the thing that is unconditionally good, good without qualification or limitation. I want to emphasize a few things about this very first sentence. Uh, the first is, obviously, the question he's asking here is what is good without qualification? Um, so he's not claiming, he's definitely not claiming that there are no other good things except a good will. There are. Many things are good besides a good will. The question here is, what is good unconditioned without qualification? Um, these other things, I just said there are many other good things. These other good things, he's going to claim, are only good under certain circumstances or only under certain conditions. So they are qualifiably good. Under certain circumstances or if certain conditions hold, then they are good. But if, I want to emphasize, but if those qualifications or circumstances or conditions hold, then those other things really are good. They're not somehow only a little bit good. They really are good under those circumstances or under those qualifications. Okay, second when this is fundamental. You can't get confused about this. You have to understand this point. When he's talking about a good will, the only thing that is good without qualification, he's talking about a good will. One of those things, a will, that is good. He's not talking about something like goodwill. He's not talking about a feeling that gets a lot of play around Christmas time, for example. He's talking about one of those objects, when it's good, is good without qualification. A will. Is that clear? So it's not a feeling of goodwill that he's talking about. It's a good will. Um, you see the few of egos right here by saying that? Ego is um, What do you mean? As in he's arguing against the ego saying that we only do things to get a feeling of doing good. Whereas here he's saying that that doesn't apply. Not yet. He will argue against that. But he's not arguing against that yet. Because we don't yet really have any idea what makes a will a good one. So I, I'm, I'm going to say something about what he means by a will in a, in a second. Um, but we don't yet know the content. Um, on the other hand, he certainly is saying, and he's about to make it explicit, that, um, well, that a certain feeling of happiness is not unconditionally good. So if, if that's what you mean, that, that's absolutely right. And we'll see why he says that just in a second. And so a good will will that is good is the only thing he's saying that's unconditionally good. Um, a will, you might say, is a certain capacity or power uh, that 
um, well, that we're assuming human beings have. And we might say that um, a good one of those is one of those which is used properly, which wills properly. Um, You might, say, you might worry that this idea of a good will being something that's unconditionally good, you might worry that there's a kind of circularity there. Um, but I, I don't actually think there is, uh, because um, his claim is that when one of those is good, it's unconditionally good. And this is not true of other things. He thinks that other things can be good, but when they are good, they are conditional. So for sure we have to worry about what makes a will a good one. Um, but, um, but, but this is something that we'll have to worry about. We'll have to, I mean, you might say a good will is a will that wills properly. Maybe it wills the proper, the right ends, and takes the right and proper means to those ends. And that's what sort of willing is. And so a good one is one that does that properly. Um, okay. Next, notice that the question here is what is good, what is unconditionally good, what is good without qualification. And when we're talking about this, we're asking what is good, period. That is, what is objectively good. Not simply what is good for me or good for you. Um, but just what is good. So there's no, uh, there's no qualification to an individual. It's simply what is good. Um, so notice that this already contrasts in an important way with Hobbes. Um, Hobbes' the subjectivism said something like, um, well, when a person desires some end, they take that end to be good for their part. So they call it good, but there's no assumption that anybody else will agree with it. There's no reason for anybody to agree, unless they happen to have a desire for that same end also. Um, so, so Kant is already rejecting something like Hobbes' subjectivism. The question is, what is objectively good? The next point uh, is this. In the argument that Kant is about to make, he's assuming that something must be unconditionally good if anything is to be good at all, even conditionally. So there has to be, Kant thinks, there has to be, as it were, a ground for value. There has to be something that forms a the basis for uh, any kind of value in other things, conditional value in other things. And so this is an argument that goes back at, at least to Aristotle. And so Kant is interested in looking at the condition that must be satisfied for anything to have value, for anything to have objective value, I just said. And it turns out, so, one more time. So, lots of things are valuable, Kant thinks. Lots of things have objective value. But they only have that objective value under certain conditions. Only uh, with qualifications. Only conditional. And so, in order to investigate the condition that makes things have value, we need to look to see what is valuable itself, unconditional. Um, and it turns out that the condition that makes things good